Hey, Zach with Real Property Associates here. This video is a follow-up to the making an offer video. And in this video, I wanna focus specifically on making a competitive offer. So right now in today's real estate market in Seattle, it's uh, December, 2016. We're seeing lots of competitive offer situations where more than one buyer, a lot of times two, three, four buyers, even more, are trying to buy the same house. And so it turns into somewhat of a silent auction type of situation where you're making your best offer and, and that's not necessarily the asking price, it's usually actually over the asking price and, and, and tightening some terms. So in this video, I wanna talk about a few things, um, price, earnest money, inspections, some of the other disclosures, and just talk about some of the strategies that we use in competitive offer situations to help set you up for success. Now, just as a disclaimer, these aren't secrets, so um, it, I'm going to publish this video. I'm not, I'm not afraid to share it. Um, these are things that I've picked up along the way as a real estate professional and have successfully negotiated uh, many multiple offer situations where my buyers were able to get the house. Now, that being said, I've also been on the losing side, and so I know what that's like as well. And so we're gonna take a look at some of the strategies that I recommend. Some buyers decide to use some of them, some decide to use all of them, and some decide to use none of them. And in, in those situations, I can tell you that usually the ones that are the most aggressive are the ones that come out on top, um, and they're the ones that end up getting the house that they want. So let's talk about a few of these strategies and a few things to keep in mind as we talk about these strategies. So first, you want your offer to stand out to the sellers. That's kind of the big picture. When there's competition, you want your offer to stand out. You also want to have an offer that is favorable to the seller. Now, you wanna be protected. That's the point of the contract that there's protections for you. And, and in my previous video on this, we talk about contingencies the butts in the contract, 1T butts, uh, B-U-T butts. And these butts protect you as the buyer in the contract. And so when you're, making a, when you're making a bid, when there's multiple offers and you're trying to impress the seller, a lot of times you end up taking some of those protections off yourself um, and, some, and waiving or removing some of those contingencies and making your offer more favorable to the seller. And really the big idea here is that if your offer, as far as price and terms, is the best, you're gonna get the house. And that's not the case in every situation. Um, I've had clients where they, they aren't the highest price and they don't have the best terms, and for some reason, they still get chosen. Um, and, and usually, and we can talk about this too, some of the other things that I, that I talk about, it's not always about price, and I've had clients that are in the middle of the pack, price-wise, still get the house, um, and usually it does come down to price or terms. Those are the two biggest biggest factors in the, in the negotiating process. So I wanna talk about those. Let's jump in. So first of all, price. So we're starting at the asking price. When there's multiple offers, unless it's some kind of a bank-owned foreclosure sale, something like that, you're starting at the asking price um, when there's multiple offers. You're not typically dealing with multiple offers below the asking price. So the bedrock's the asking price, and then what I like to tell clients and advise clients on is you have to pick in the, the silent bidding sec, like aspect of it, you have to pick that walk away number. What, where's that point where you are okay saying, yes, I got the house and you're excited about it. And where's that point where you're willing to say, you know what, I'm glad somebody else got it. I didn't want to pay that much. That's kind of the idea. And that's a good way to think about um, your, your bid number. And so when we, when we make an offer with, uh, in a multiple offer situation, we'll, we'll offer um, an, at the asking price, but we'll also include what's called an escalator clause. And so this escalator clause, and I talked about this in the previous video, and I'll do it a little bit more here. The escalator clause is going to do a few things. First of all, it's going to set a top number. It's going to be, it's going to be your walkaway number. You're going to put that number where you're happy if you get it, and you're happy if you don't get it. And then you're also going to choose an increment. And this increment is a dollar amount that you're willing to pay over the next best offer. So if somebody, for example, offers 500,000 and you're willing to pay 2,500 more than that, then you're going to end up making an offer that's 500 and, uh, well, 500,000, 200, 2,500, something like that. That's a really hard number to spit out. But the idea is that you're gonna pay $2,500 more than the next best number 
all the way up to your cap. And so if there's offers that are over yours, you'll just go up to your cap and stop there. That's gonna be your top price. <clears throat> in, a traditional, um, in a traditional situations around Seattle, we're seeing somewhere between two to 4% over the asking price. I'd even say it's closer to three to 4% has been the average all year as far as transactions. So the majority of sales are going over the asking price. Now, if it's a really hot home, we could see somewhere between five, 10, 15, 20%. I've seen even more over the asking price. And as crazy as that sounds, if you like a house a lot and it's your favorite house and it's the best house you've seen, it's usually that way for other people too. And so, especially if you're in some of those um, more sweet spot price ranges where there's a lot more first time home buyers and there's a lot more people that can afford it, you're gonna be looking at the, the stiff competition we've been talking about. Um, and like I said, this is 2016, so this is a video specifically targeted towards multiple offer situations right now. <clears throat> One thing I like to do too before we set our price is I'll actually touch base with the agent so I can get a feel for where, uh, where, where their other offers are. Some agents are willing to disclose quite a bit of information. Some agents will keep their lips shut. And so the more information we can get from the agent, the better you know, we're able to talk about your offer. Now, the downside is if an agent's willing to tell you everything, they're probably willing to tell everybody else everything too. So just, just, just know that especially with those agents that are willing to disclose the information we want to know, they're telling everybody else that same information. And so it is helpful to know where we're at, but at the same time, remember that other people are likely getting that same information. And really the key is what are you gonna do with that information and, and how are you gonna act? And so even with that information, I, I still think the best way to operate is where are you going to be happy that you got it and where are you gonna be happy that you didn't get it? So that's price. Let's talk about earnest money a little bit. And so I've really dove into what earnest money is and I'll add a few things to that conversation here. So really, you're trying to show the, buy, the, the seller that you're serious as the buyer. You're showing them that you're serious. And so your earnest money and your, or your good faith deposit, as you talked about in the other video, is really, the, the goal of this is to show that you're serious to the seller. And so you wanna choose an amount that is going to entice them. And so traditionally, somewhere between one to 3% of the range. A lot of time we look at somewhere between two to 3% of the purchase price. Um, and so that's, you know, in a fund of $500,000 purchase, 10 to 15,000, somewhere in there. The, the purpose of earnest money is to um, show that you're serious and also protect the seller in case you decide to default on the contract um, without any legal reason. And so that's kind of the purpose of the earnest money there. And so of course they wanna see the biggest amount possible there. And in Washington state, five five percent is the limit. And so in a competitive situation, you know, you're going to want to be on the stronger side on the earnest money up to 5%. So really you're going to be picking a number that's the strongest number that you can stomach and the strongest number that you're willing to part with. And in, in some cases, you know, it's not going to cost the seller $20,000 in damages if, you're, if their house is off the market for a month. but. It's, it's good to know that that strong earnest money amount is enticing to a seller. So, you know, when, when we're, we're discussing that, keep that in mind that the stronger that number is, the more favorable your offer looks. That's, that's the point of it. But ultimately, you have to pick that number just like you have to pick the price. <clears throat> another, another thing to talk about is inspections. And so traditionally, you have seven to 10 days to do your inspection and we get to, we get to write in that number. In a competitive situation, if there's not a lot of time to do um, inspections ahead of time, we'll do a short inspection period. So that's, it could be one to two days. And we just set up an inspection ahead of time and we know that we don't have a lot of time to do our inspection and to get back to the seller and let them know if we do intend to purchase the house or not, or if we wanna ask for any concessions. A lot of times when there's multiple offer situations, sometimes the seller, and this isn't that frequent, but maybe on five to 10% of deals, the or listings the seller will actually do a pre-inspection themselves and that's where they have a licensed inspector come out inspect the property and sometimes they'll do a sewer scope too and the sewer scope is where the where a um, <clears throat> guy will put a camera down the sewer line just to make sure that there's no issues with the sewer um, i don't think i touched on that in the other video so um, added bonus for those of you that are watching this one the sewer scope and the inspection sometimes they'll actually include those reports in the listing so that you can see those reports and you don't have to do an inspection on your own. A lot of buyers, I would say, go off those reports. Um, 
and, and go ahead and just not waive their inspection. Don't do an inspection at all in the multiple offer situations. There are some that still want to do an inspection, and so that's where we would go with a really short time frame, even if the seller did it up front. Other, other things that you can do, so you can actually do your own pre-inspection. So if, typically you have seven to 10 days. In a competitive situation, a seller will set an offer review date or a bid date, and you'll have seven to 10 days to check out the property, do your inspections, and make a decision on what your offer is going to look like. And so in that situation, you're gonna have an inspector come out ahead of time. They can do a full inspection, and you're gonna see those typically are somewhere between you know, four to $500. Or they can do what they, they call a happy meal. It's more of like a pre-offer consultation or pre-inspection you hear. If it's before the offer, it's technically a pre-inspection, but a lot of times people will get an elect for more of the happy meal style inspection, the, um, the write-up pre-offer consultation. And, and a lot of inspectors will give you the handwritten notes and discuss with you what they found. And so they'll go through all the systems, they'll look at everything just like they would, all the major systems like they would during a a traditional full inspection, but you don't get the PDF report. So it saves them time and it allows them to give you a little bit better price. And typically we're around, you know, two to $300 for the pre-inspection. So just, just have that in the back of your mind. You are, you're either having a shorter inspection period that can make your offer more favorable. You're doing a pre-inspection and inspection ahead of time. Sometimes the seller's already done it. Sometimes that's, that's on you. And then other times, people just elect to outweigh their inspection. And I would say that's pretty risky. And I don't say as a, as a real estate professional, it's not something that I say, yeah, you should do that. But it is something that you can do if you have a tight window, or maybe, maybe you just started looking for a house a couple days ago and, and we found the perfect one and there's not time to do a pre-inspection and there's no inspection uploaded. That would be a situation where you might decide you were just gonna waive your inspection. And, that's something that typically people with a lot of money do. So they're, they're not really worried about making repairs and they don't care too much if there are things that are wrong. I've had clients in that situation. And that's also a situation where maybe you're more handy and it doesn't really matter what you find on the inspection, you can fix it. Or you're a third or fourth time home buyer, it's not your first rodeo and you've been there or done that before. If it's your first time, that's a, that's a, that's a tough thing to do. And so I don't advise that, but it is an option um, in the inspection part and does make your offer stronger. Essentially, the inspection clause in Washington, unfortunately, kind of acts more of like a, yeah, I think I want to buy it, but I have a seven to 10 days to back out is typically what it is. And that, you know, that's a time where you would do your inspection. If you don't like it, you get your earnest money back. And so a seller doesn't like in a competition, a seller doesn't like that as part of the contract. They'd rather just not see that at all. <clears throat> A few other things. So financing. This is the biggest, this is one of the biggest parts of the, the contract, especially when we're talking about competition. And so cash is king. If you're making a cash offer, it's definitely favorable to the seller. And, and the reason that is, is because you don't have an inspection or you don't have a financing contingency. And the financing contingency is another out. Typically, it's not as big of a an issue a lot of times even in com competitive situations my clients still can have financing and win and even with lower down payments five percent so it's not all about that but if there's a cash offer it's really nice so I want to talk a bit about a few of the things that you could do if you have financing that would make your offer a little stronger so um, first of all there's different types of loans so you can get a conventional loan you can have a VA loan you can have an FHA loan, and there's there's other options, but those are kind of some of the main main um, routes that people go. When a when a seller's looking at the different options, unfortunately, conventional is typically the one they like the best, and that's the one where <clears throat> they don't have the government. There's not as much um, government intervention, and so they don't have to worry about other approvals and, and restrictive standards. And so, typically, people like to see the conventional loan. I've had clients win with these other loans, but I, I just want you to know that's if you can, if you can choose between a, a low FA, a low down payment FHA or a low down payment conventional, the conventional is going to be more favorable in the eyes of a seller. So just something to keep in mind. Other things, a larger down payment is also favorable. If your offer is identical to somebody else's and they're going to put down 20%, you're only going to put down 5%. Unfortunately, their financing looks quite a bit stronger than yours. Um, the 
<clears throat> the greater the down payment, the more wiggle room there is in case an appraisal coming in low, and that's gonna look better for the person with the larger down payment. The other thing that's other thing that's important is the speed of closing, and, and that's kind of tied up in financing, the, the typical delays in closing. So 30 to 45 days is typically the range. Financing is the biggest factor in there. How quickly can we get financing? And so working with a lender that's experienced and working with a lender that's reputable and can close on a quicker time frame, um, more towards the 30 days or sooner, is a lot more favorable in a lot of situations. Not every situation, but in a lot of situations, that's most favorable. Um, and that's typically found with the smaller lending institutions. The bigger banks are not always as favorable. And I'm not gonna name names or put anybody under the bus, but I've had dealings with some of the bigger banks and those are the ones that typically go slower. So if you're looking for a recommendation for a lender, um, if you're at this point, you've likely already, we're already well on our way to, we've already got our pre-approval and we're well on our way there. But if you're watching this online or you're watching this um, somewhere else, you're going to maybe need a recommendation. So feel free to reach out to me for that if you need it. Other things. So we've talked generally about things that make your financing stronger. <clears throat> Other things, if you're really ambitious, you can outright waive your financing. So you can still make an offer and have a have financing, but when you waive your financing contingency or don't include it, what you're doing is you are making your offer not contingent on the financing. So if you, for some reason, don't get a loan or you lose your job or something happens with your financing and the, the bank's not gonna lend you the money, your earnest money is on the line. Your earnest money is going to the, going to the seller. That, that's, that's, that's the reality of it. They're going to be the ones that would have legal claim over that. You can also, you know, in other, in a, if, that's, if you can't stomach that, there's also, you can do um, waive your financing and have an appraisal contingency still. And I've had clients do that too. And so what that means um, is that sometimes the appraisal comes in low. The bank will go send, the bank's a third party goes out on behalf of the bank and does an inspection and does their own valuation of the property. And sometimes they come back and they say, you know what, we think the property is actually worth a little less. And, and you see that a lot in a slower market um, sometimes, but you also see that when there's these prices that are really inflated with multiple offers. <clears throat> so when that comes back low, if you have an appraisal contingency, um, you're able to negotiate that price difference or have, a, have an out, an opportunity to get your earnest money back. And that's the same case with the um, financing contingency. Now, if you don't have either of those, um, and in the case I have had clients in that situation, you are now responsible for making up that difference yourself. The other route you can go is you can have, like we mentioned, you can outright waive your inspection, your financing, but keep appraisal. And then you can also have your financing contingency, but um, either waive the appraisal. And so you're saying you're gonna get financing, but you'll make up the difference or you can offer what's called appraisal protection. And that's where you would give a dollar amount that you're willing to make up. So you'd say, you know, I'm willing to make up the difference up to $20,000 uh, in a discrepancy between the, um, the value of the appraisal and the purchase price. And I've seen that too. And then I've had clients that have done that and that's worked for them. So there's multiple options that are layered in here. And all of this information I'm giving you, it's not exhaustive and it's not all inclusive. It's just some of the strategies that we use. So each situation is gonna be a little different and we're gonna have other things to maybe add or talk about, but these are just some of the general things that we go to first and, and we talk about first. Um, one thing to add and tie back to the earnest money, um, we were talking about <clears throat> earnest money just a second ago, so there's a few other things you can do with your earnest money. You can outright uh, make it non-refundable. So you can, you can still have your contingencies to be able to get out of the contract, but you can just make your earnest money non-refundable. Um, and that, that would mean that the seller would just be able to get your earnest money no matter what. And that's also appealing. Um, and another thing with the earnest money is you can also release it to the seller early. And so I've seen this happen, and this happens a lot. Builders like to see this. Um, and builders will do this uh, when, they're, when they're purchasing property. But when you're a buyer, if you're willing to release your earnest money, and it's essentially you're making it non-refundable. So you're just saying, here, here's your earnest money check. Keep it. I'm buying the house. That's even the most, that's like taking it even a step farther than just having a larger earnest money deposit. You're saying here, here's the, here's the money up front and, and go ahead and, and take it and then we'll, we'll pay you the rest later. That's, that's the ultimate, um, that's the ultimate, um, I guess, show of 
um, good faith with your earnest money. Um, typically, the earnest money goes to the escrow company, but in this case, you would just be giving it directly to the seller. Um, they won't earn us money to, from the escrow company, and then the escrow company will re release it to the seller. Um, but that's just another couple things to add on to the earnest money section there. So we've talked about earnest money, we've talked about financing, we've talked about inspections, we've talked about the purchase price. There's a few other things that are gonna, you're going to want to consider. So there's a few disclosures. There's a lead-based paint disclosure and a seller disclosure. I've talked about that in the other video. I'm not going to get into what those are specifically, but you, if you're in a competitive situation, most people, if not all, will waive their right to conduct a lead-based paint dis, um, inspection, and that's for a home older than 1978, or, and or they'll go ahead and waive their right to revoke their offer based on the seller's disclosure. Those are two very common things um, in, a, in a competitive situation. So you're gonna see people that are going way over the asking price, you're gonna see people that are doing shorter inspections, pre-inspections or waiving them altogether, you're going to see uh, people that are waiving their financing or you know, giving some kinds of um, consideration for appraisals coming in short. Um, you're going to see excessive amounts of earnest money offered or earnest money just handed over um, as a, as a pre-release to the seller. And then there's a few other things that you might see um, <clears throat> that we, we come across. So there's a verification of information clause. And again, this is all very heady information, but there's a clause in the purchase and sale agreement that states that you have a period um, of time to make sure that all the information about the property is correct as far as you know the square footage, the bedrooms, bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. And that's an opportunity for you to back out if that information is incorrect. And so sometimes people will even cross that off. Um, I've also seen, sometimes we talked about quicker closes being appealing. Sometimes a longer close is appealing to a seller or a rent back, maybe a quicker close, but then offering for the seller to be able to live there for free for a short amount of time. That's also another strategy especially when there's a maybe somebody needs to you know buy another house or they are waiting to close on their other house that's sometimes appealing <clears throat> and then some people like to write a letter it's not usually impactful some sellers don't even want to look at a personal letter from a buyer but um, sometimes i have clients that give me a letter and i will pass it along it's not something that i say yeah you should do this but i have clients that will that will want to do that and that's fine i'll pass it along um, sometimes a video, maybe a video, you know, the video would be even more personal than a handwritten letter, um, especially if the <laughs> listing agent was willing to show that. So those are just a, a few things that you could do in addition to the other tactics we've talked about. Overall, like I said, this isn't an exhaustive list. It's just a starting point, but it, there are so many things and so many layers to making a, and winning multiple offer situations. So um, please, I know you're going to have some questions. And after watching the video on how to make an offer and what that looks like, and then watching this one on multiple offers, I hope you have a pretty good and thorough understanding of what the process looks like in making an offer in the Seattle area, Seattle and Bellevue areas. If you do have other questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about those, dialogue about those, and of course, um, help you guys make um, competitive and strong offers. Until next time, bye for now.